All right, everybody, uh, welcome back. Our second panel is titled Regulatory Sandboxes and Other Laboratories of Democracy. It centers around a new paper by Brian Knight and Trace Mitchell titled The Sandbox Paradox. Our moderator is Professor Paolo Sagato. He's an assistant professor of law at the Antonin Scalia Law School, specializing in financial regulation. We're proud that he's among the Gray Center's affiliated faculty and pleased that he can join us today. Paolo? Perfect. Thank you, Adam, and thank you all for being here today. You know, the weather, it's pretty chilly, and so our mind goes into sandboxes and on a beach. So I'm honored to moderate this panel, and I'm briefly introducing the speakers, and then I'm going to let them set the stage for the discussion. So my right is Brian Knight. He's Director of Innovation and Governance and Senior Research Fellow at Mercado Center at George Mason University. Brian has been writing a lot of very interesting pieces on financial regulation and financial technology. Uh, Brian Wright is Remington Gregg. Remington is Counsel for Civil Justice and Consumer Rights at Public Citizen. He was an attorney at the Human Rights Campaign, and before that, he was Associate Counsel and Advisor for Open Government in the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy. On the far right is uh, Kate Chano Mauler. She is a proud alumna of the school, and I'm very proud we are very proud to have her here. Uh, she is a regulatory lawyer working uh, with data and technology, and most recently she was senior counsel at Uber Technologies, where she serves as Uber regulatory lead in various US region. Uh, today, I'm responsible for moderating a very timely panel, regulatory sandboxes. And regulatory sandboxes, just to set quickly the stage, are innovative regulatory initiative to tackle the challenges on how to help innovation and technology to support markets and consumers. Uh, regulatory sandboxes tend to polarize the discussion. In 2018, the uh, Treasury, report, a Treasury report recommended that states and federal regulators uh, should establish regulatory sandboxes to enhance and support uh, innovation following the steps of some state initiatives and also some foreign uh, government initiatives. But a very recent report uh, by the UN, a working group on FinTech of the UN, said a very interesting thing. Uh, lesson learned from early regulatory sandboxes highlight that they are neither necessary nor sufficient for promoting financial inclusion. So I think with this uh, quote from the UN report, I'm leaving the stage to Brian to set the stage for the discussion. And so like, what we're going to try to tackle in this panel is like, where do we stand with regulatory sandboxes? What are they and uh, how they support public interest? Brian? Thank you. Uh, so yeah, um, regulatory sandboxes, uh, first, whoa. First, first let's, let's uh, do a little definitional work, um, because there are different definitions for sandboxes. My co-author and I, the, the one we use is that a regulatory sandbox is a closed testing environment where specific firms are able to experiment with new and innovative models or products um, under some modifi modified regulatory requirements or environment. Um, why, are, why do we see jurisdictions standing up sandboxes? Well, it kind of varies. Very frequently, the justifications are to encourage innovation, to encourage, encourage entrepreneurship, to encourage competition. Sometimes there is an explicit industrial policy element to it where the goal is to attract business to a spe the specific jurisdiction and thus attract the jobs and taxes that come along with the business. Um, sometimes there is an explicit or implicit consumer protection mandate in the sense that, um, you know, to take the, F the United Kingdom's Financial Conduct Authority, who were the original uh, sandbox entrepreneurs in this space, their view is, Competition is consumer protective. A sandbox will help facilitate competition. Therefore, a sandbox is consumer protective. Um, there are numerous sandboxes in the, in the, on, in the world and in uh, many uh, jurisdictions who don't have them yet are con seriously considering them. In the United States, we have three states that have sandboxes, Arizona, Wyoming, and Utah. Uh, something about right angles. Uh, track sandboxes. Um, and then the CFPB has announced a sandbox program. They've, they've finalized their internal rulemaking and uh, are, you know, I don't know 
if it has actively gone live yet, but it's in, if it hasn't, it will be do going so very soon. So in terms of, well, what, what is exactly a sandbox? Like what are, what are, what's going on in a sandbox? Generally speaking, and there are, there's, there's variation in this, and it's going to vary from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. But as a general model, and we'll talk about, about a couple of the prominent exceptions in a minute, picture an environment where there is gated access that requires the regulator to grant access or approval. And the regulator has, jurisdiction, has, a, has a discretion as to whether or not to grant approval. And so a firm that wishes to participate in this modified regulatory environment must apply to the regulator and be granted access. Generally, there is a limited time duration and or a limited number of customers or value that can be transacted in the sandbox. So it isn't a permanent status. It is a ranging from months to, ye to a couple of years trial period. In terms of the relief that the firms get, it varies from jurisdiction to jurisdiction, and it varies based upon what sort of jurisdiction the administering regulator has. So very frequently, if the administering regulator is a, a responsible for licensing, so picture uh, you know, the FCA is a licensing body, the uh, Arizona, is a, Arizona is a licensing entity, they, they license lenders, money transmitters, and they charter state-level banks. What, one, of the re, one of the more prominent forms of relief that's available is what amounts to sort of a learner's permit. And so instead of having to go and get, do the full-blown application for a full-blown lending or money transmission license, for example, you are allowed, you get a modified license that allows you to test out your product in, the, in this environment for a, a limited period of time. Other forms of relief can, can involve things like uh, modified uh, liability or safe harbors. Um, I don't know if I'd call it relief, but other benefits can include uh, formal and informal guidance on the part of the regulator. So you can go to the regulator and ask questions and they'll give you answers. Um, and then very frequently, you know, so what's the regulator getting out of all of this? And I should have mentioned this earlier. Another reason why, why regulators uh, are standing up sandboxes is, is to get more information themselves about what's going on in the industry because of there's, there's concern that technology is moving so quickly that the regulators are going to be left behind and not know what's going on until it's too late and, you know, something blows up 10 years from now and they had no idea what was going on. So part of what the regulators get out of this deal <coughs> is that there is a very frequently a, a relatively intensive supervision and information sharing requirement. And so a firm that would not necessarily be supervised by opting into the sandbox effectively becomes a supervised firm. Australia is a prominent exception to, to everything I just laid out. And they're, they're the uh, Australian Securities and Investment Commission has a FinTech <coughs> licensing exemption, and the way that works is instead of applying at the beginning and, and being granted access at the regulator's discretion, the regulator enumerates pretty prescriptive and, and relatively stringent requirements. And then if you meet those requirements, you can just kind of notify the regulator that, hey, we meet these requirements, we're taking advantage of your exemption. That gives you two years to test out certain types of products and certain types of, uh, on certain types of customers without having to then go get the full license. At the end of the two years, you have to turn in a report. The regulator kind of checks to make certain that you were in fact in, in compliance, and then you go get your license if it worked, and if it didn't, you, you don't. Um, the CFPB recently announced a sandbox, and the CFPB is a bit different in that they are not a licensing body. The CFPB can't give you a license even if it wanted to. So what they do is they, it, it requires an application, and what they will do is they will grant an, a regulatory approval for acts that the CFPB deems to be lawful under ECOA, TILA, and EFTA, so Equal Credit Opportunity Act, Truth and Lending Act, and Electronic Funds Transfer Act. Um, so, and so in that scenario, that provides a safe harbor from CFPB enforcement, and I would argue, and unfortunately Paul isn't here to, for me to put him on the spot, uh, that the CFPB takes the position that that also protects you from state-level uh, enforcement and private act causes of action under those laws. And so in this scenario, it's not you getting a learner's permit to try something out. You, you, know, you need the appropriate, if it requires a license, you need to have the license because the CFPB can't give you one. But what it, they do say is, well, okay, look, if you do this thing, 
we we are going to deem that to be acceptable under the law, and you have a safe harbor from from liability under the law. Now, whether or not they can do that, whether or not they can do that and block state and private causes of action is controversial. Uh, Finally, uh, a, a very recent potential sandbox example is the Securities and Exchange Commission, who by no action letter granted a firm called Paxos a two-year trial period to test out a blockchain-enabled clearance and settlement service without having to register. And the, C the SEC didn't take the position that registration was otherwise unnecessary under the law. What they, and they, what they said is, look, we're not going to bring an enforcement action against you for two years if you conduct your trial in a certain way, limited number of customers, de minimis amount of, of funds, et cetera. So if you meet these requirements, in effect, we will exercise prosecutorial discretion and not come after you. And that kind of looks sandboxy, right? Because they aren't saying what, what you very frequently see in no action letters, which is like, well, look, this complies with the law if you do it this way, or if you do it this way, you're outside the law. There's no, obli there's no question that you, they, Paxos should have to register. They're just not going to make an issue of it for two years. Risks and rewards of sandboxes. Well, we've kind of mentioned some of these. Potential rewards include increased entrepreneurialism and innovation, more legal certainty for firms. Heighten, we can debate whether or not this is, a, this is an advantage. If you're a regulator, uh, you might view it as an advantage of heightened regulatory oversight of participating firms. So firms aren't off your radar. They're very much on your radar. You know what they're doing potentially lower barriers to entry, and faster access to markets. Well, what about the costs or the potential costs? Well, there are a lot of costs that, that have been discussed, including the potential risk for, uh, or uh, potential, potential costs, I should say. One is the potential for consumer harm. If these laws that are being waived or relaxed or whatever are in fact consumer protective, are we not in fact putting consumers at greater risk? Now, many of these sandboxes do include consumer protection requirements, in the form of insurance or an ability to repay or make whole harmed customers. So it's not that these, these, these uh, sandboxes are, are you know, indifferent to consumer protection. The question is whether or not they go far enough. Potential safety and soundness issues have been raised, though given the fact that these are supposed to be small scale experiments, I'm not entirely convinced that that's a real risk, but we'll see. Uh, Likewise, the systemic instability and decreased regulatory control. Now, I, I think it's a little, you know, critics, some critics will point these as like lawless environments when in fact, you know, they're very much law, like you, you, the regulator is letting you into their sandbox and perched over your shoulder. That strikes me as a pretty law intensive environment. But there's, a, there's another risk that, that my co-author, Trace Mitchell, and I wanted to really highlight because we think it's been somewhat under-discussed, and that is the risk to market competition, potentially, because of what, you know, what we refer to as the sandbox paradox, which is that to be valuable, the, to, for anyone to use it, a sandbox has to give something valuable to the firm. But in a competitive market, that, the, the regulatory grant of value to one firm disadvantages all the other firms who didn't get it. And in a world of, regulatory, of limited regulatory resources, it's going to be very hard for the regulator to sort of take all comers. And so it, this could take a couple of different forms. If you get the learner's permit license and your competitor has to go through the whole licensing process, that lets you get the market faster, albeit a, minimize, a, you know, a, sub, a subscribe, servant-scribed market. But you're still out there, you're still testing, you're still developing buzz, you're still developing a reputation. If you're getting relaxed regulatory treatment and other people aren't, that may put you at a, at a better advantage, at a, a, li a liability advantage. If going through the sandbox gives you some sort of imperator of government approval, a gold star, or, or a perceived gold star, that might give you an advantage. Uh, there's evidence coming out of the UK that firms that go through the sandbox are more likely to get venture funding. Well, if the difference between why firm A and firm B got venture funding is, well, they went through the sandbox, that may pose a problem. And then to the extent that you're benefiting from private consultation with the regulator, the regulator, there's the risk that the regulator basically serves as your consultant. So what can be done about this? Well, you know, I, I don't want anyone to take from this that we, th we think sandboxes are bad. We don't. We think that they are potentially a valuable tool. They're not a panacea. They're not a cure-all by any stretch, but they're a potentially valuable tool. 
But we need to acknowledge that these risks exist so that we can mitigate them. And the things, you know, there are some things that we can do. First, the regulators should be very open about reporting out their findings, not the specific proprietary information of the firm, but to the extent that the regulator can, can report out in a fulsome way, these regulatory issues cropped up, these are kind of issues of first impression, and here's our analysis. I'm running out of time, so I'll be quick. Uh, that would be a, 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 you know, good. Also, low barriers to entry are important, and not, another thing is not viewing firms that go through the sandbox as inherently good or more trustworthy than firms that don't, because sandboxes should be a voluntary exercise. And with that, I've run out of time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Brian. Remington? Thank you very much. Um, uh, good morning. So the question for today's conversation is, what are regulatory sandboxes and do they promote the public interest? Proponing the public interest, in my view at least, is the first goal of government. Uh, several statutes, including the Communications Act of 1934, mention specifically that, uh, advancing the public interest. And the CFPB, much like those laws, was enacted uh, in the public interest. In fact, the term shows up 87 times in the Dodd-Frank Act. According to the Financial Crisis Inquiry Report, the CFPB was established in part due to the, quote, widespread failures in financial regulation and supervision, end quote. It notes that Regulators had ample powers to pre prevent the crisis, but they chose not. And Congress, therefore, created the CFPB to fill in those regulatory and supervisory gaps. So I look at regulatory sandboxes from this context. That is, sandboxes and similar experiments should foster innovation, yes, but must promote the public interest. And through that lens, the primary responsibility for regulatory bodies that create these innovations is to protect consumers. So the key question for me is, do regulatory sandboxes undermine consumer protection? The short answer is yes. The longer answer, which I will discuss, is maybe not. Sounds like a, a law school uh, class to me. With the proviso that certain guardrails need to be in place for, that, for, for sandboxes not to undermine consumer protection. In 2016, the Obama administration articulated how these types of policies could be used to curb uh, uncertainty in the marketplace, but noted the importance of limitations in order to protect consumers. So the literature suggests a few overarching principles that I think most agree on. Balancing the usefulness of sandbox policies with protecting consumers, uh, time limitations on a recipient's participation in the sandbox, and the ability to revoke a recipient's participation. And there are some differences that I think most people agree on. Um, time durations are different for the different sandboxes. Uh, an eye toward what is innovation uh, or innovative. I think there is some discussion about what exactly that means. And the use of sandboxes to test products and services and assess metrics in a controlled environment. Some sandboxes do that versus simply allowing participants in the sandbox uh, simply under some vague notion of fostering innovation. So when Mick Mulvaney became acting director of the CFPB, he said, said that he no longer wanted the CFPB to, quote, push the envelope. Uh, but I think that's exactly what sandboxes do, and in particular, the CFPB's policies. And here are a few reasons why. First, it gives companies a safe harbor designed to be binding on the agency against enforcement, and this is in, in the, the final rule, to the fullest extent permitted and is of unlimited duration for no action letters. The CFPB, in its policy, said that it expects decisions will be made within 60 days. Now, such a decision to grant a company safe harbor from liability for an unlimited duration for no action letters and significant duration for approvals should be conducted with, I think, great deliberation, given that a lot of these products are innovative and they're complex products and services. So to me, telegraphing that the agency will take as little time as possible uh, to approve uh, your, uh, your request, um, to me, is just a way of rubber stamping what the agency wants to do, which is namely allow more companies to, uh, to, to have the safe harbor from a liability. Three, in terms of duration, this is a problem. Again, no action letters, there's unlimited duration. Um, for approvals, there is a two-year um, uh, um, 
you, you get two years in the, for the approval, but it's a very easy extension. So in, in essence, you're getting four years pretty easily, and who knows how, long, how much longer after that. And this is in contrast to the Obama administration, which uh, for their no action letter policy used it very sparingly and said that um, we're going to take you know, the time that we need in order to approve it. Uh, I think that showed kind of the regulatory humility that Mr. Mulvaney often talks about. Um, and then finally, it allows trade associations, consumer groups, and third parties the right to apply for safe harbor on behalf of a wide swath of entities. Now this is troubling, I think, because uh, it allows whole industries to receive safe harbor rather than uh, doing this in a case-by-case -case basis. Um, uh, and then second, it fosters what Brian uh, terms the governmental economic privilege and what Professor Hillary Allen termed regulatory imprimatur. So what's the answer? It's certainly not the CFPB sandbox policy, in my opinion. Guardrails are essential. A sandbox should not stand in the way of, should not be a way for industries to simply receive blanket permission um, or blanket turn of the regulatory eye. So in what ways could these innovations be okay? Because I think we should be able to come to some consensus. Um, I think they could become okay in a few ways. First, products and services should be truly innovative. In my view, the Arizona uh, uh, Attorney General's office has granted waivers in some dubious products. Uh, so for example, there is one um, <clears throat> where in the, that's in the sandbox policy. The product description is a business model for income sharing agreements that provide qualified consumers with a fixed amount of money in exchange for a percentage of the consumer's future income over a period of time, subject to contingencies involving periods of employment or lowered income. You know, that might be innovative, but uh, it may not be. And it doesn't sound like it is. And we don't want regu regulators simply turning a blind eye uh, to companies uh, because we don't want to usher in another era of uh, lax regulation. And something like that doesn't seem truly innovative. The way the United Kingdom talks about the things that they are uh, emitting into their sandbox. So we should only use sandboxes to give greater certainty to companies that they have truly innovative products or services that were, that were not envisioned when the law was passed or the regulation at issue was promulgated. Second, inclusion in the sandbox should be of limited duration. So in the UK, according to its website, the default duration is three to six months in order to foster testing and measure success and risk assessment. It should not be used as a way to simply keep a company out of the hairs of regulatory or supervisory efforts. And finally, it should remove upfront guarantees. Products and services that are truly innovative and complex and may be very new to regulators should not be given upfront guarantees that they need not follow the law. And take a few examples of why this may be harmful to consumers. So a new study just out, uh, this month, uh, from a, a couple of professors from the University of California, found that, quote, lenders charge otherwise equivalent Latino and black borrowers 7.9 BPS higher rates for purchase mortgages, con uh, costing $765 million a year. FinTechs fail to eliminate impermissible discrimination, end quote. It was their findings. And just this week, it was reported that Apple's new credit card gave two women 20 times lower and 10 times lower uh, the amount in credit, respectively, than their husbands, even though they filed joint tax returns and owned property together. And in one of those cases, this was done to Apple's co-founder, uh, Steve Wozniak's wife, um, who I can imagine isn't much of a credit risk. So you know, there are contexts in which we still don't know a lot about technologies, and given blanket waivers to technologies in which we still don't know a lot about them and can cause mischief is not something that we, where we want to be, especially as it relates to, for example, anti-discrimination laws. So the number one priority must be promoting the public interest and protecting consumers for all these sandboxes. So innovation is important. Entrepreneurs are important. Ensuring the, that new and innovative products get into the market, help us financially in times of crises, and otherwise just make life easier should be promoted but not to the detriment of robust supervision and enforcement. Uh, we've seen what happens when we don't regulate, and so we shouldn't make that mistake again. Thanks. Thank you, Raminton. Yeah.
Um, and I'm coming at this from the perspective of uh, where industry stands in relation to how these regulatory relationships evolve. Um, and uh, shockingly, um, I have a slightly different perspective on what the roles of industry and regulators are on consumer protection and the public interest. Um, to start, I'd like to just um, encourage you to challenge a few of the baselines that we're beginning from here. Um, first of all, thinking of the baseline uh, environment against which these sandboxes operate. Um, of course, these are typically fleshed out regulatory environments from which there is a relief granted for a limited duration under the sandboxes. But I encourage you to think in a more uh, blue sky way about the way the regulatory environment could or should have been drafted initially, because a lot of times the goal of these sandboxes is to figure out what the best way is of regulating these industries uh, or these practices. So I encourage you to think if you were if you were drafting from scratch or thinking from scratch about how to approach it, that helps to consider what the benefits and the costs are of the actual uh, operation of the sandboxes and also of the way that the industries that are that are operating in those sandboxes can experience those. Um, and then the second just baseline uh, assumption that I encourage you to think through is what the alternatives are. Um, it's not a matter of, uh, it, it, typically, it's not a matter of whether there is uh, an, a regulatory environment that, that operates um, without any discretion um, or without any change industry to industry or, uh, or firm to firm. Um, and so there will always be some variation in terms of how industry members experience regulatory relationships, uh, regulations themselves, enforcement. Um, and the sandbox is a way of making that explicit, um, but there will always be some implicit differences. So I just encourage you to think through what the, what the alternatives are to the sandbox model as we're talking through the pros and cons and the impact on the public interest. Um, so starting from the industry perspective, um, uh, thinking through how companies interact with regulators as a baseline, um, typically, the, the sandbox relationship can be a much higher touch. I know we've touched on that just a little bit. Um, but these typically aren't areas where there's not a lot of back and forth. Um, in fact, uh, typically, there's a lot more. There are compliance reports. Um, there's more auditing. There, there are a lot more questions. Um, and because it's typically a limited duration experiment, um, there's typically a check-in period where the regulator will be very, very aware of what the company is or the industry is doing. Um, so typically, this is, this is uh, uh, these models are areas where there's not an operation outside of the regulatory regime, but rather uh, simply uh, permitting the companies to experiment a bit, uh, but with much more transparency than there might be under a more traditional uh, regulatory relationship. Um, and then secondly, um, the, the, the way that the regulator typically will interact with, the indus with industry or the businesses um, Innovative businesses will always be ahead of government, and that's a good thing. We want that. We want it to be that that the regulators are trying to create a situation where a business can innovate, can change, can be entrepreneurial, um, and can really help improve what the baselines are for consumers, because that ultimately is what uh, improves the, the consumer experience. Um, if we have the most innovative people uh, in our country that are working in government or in other countries, um, then that can often be to the detriment um, of consumers in the long run. Um, so it's a good thing if the government is a, is a bit behind and is trying to draft um, in response to innovative or industry uh, changes, rather than trying to, to craft a, a scenario up front where those, where those new innovations um, are, are already regulated before, before they're launched. Um, so there will always be a bit of a lag time between what the regs say and what the industry is doing. Um, what the sandboxes do is they make it so that there's an opportunity to make those experiments uh, known, to make them public. Um, it makes it so that rather than going to a regulator ahead of launching a new experiment or a new product, um, there's there's an environment in which there's a permission for the experiment, and there's not a there's not a permissive uh, uh, specific authorization ahead of launching that uh, that experiment. Um, so that can allow for a lot more change, for much more thinking uh, on the business's feet, um, for for making changes in real time in response to consumer response, and to being able to uh, craft uh, additional safety. Uh, safety uh, measures if necessary, or additional responsive measures as necessary um, as the experiment rolls out, rather than having committed ahead of time to a very specific way of doing something and then not being able to deviate because of what you'd committed to with that regulator. 
Um, thinking through what the suspended regulatory environment does uh, in terms of impacting firms, um, we touched a bit on how planning operates. And what a sandbox will do is it makes it so that in the short term, there's more opportunity for planning in that immediate term because you have a sense of what the expectations are, what that duration will be in that limited time. However, on the longer term planning, it can be more difficult because the expectation is not that there will be forever a suspended regulatory environment, but rather that there's going to wind up being some regulations drafted, some response, uh, some promise of enforcement in the longer run, and that it will be different from what the short-term environment is, the, the environment in which you're experimenting in the first place. Um, so it's not necessarily always a boon uh, to the industry or to firms to have these environments because there isn't always going to be um, a long-term permissive environment. Um, thinking through the consumer protection aspects um, against that backdrop, um, sandboxes typically are not a desert. I know that that's, not, that's I loved that phrase, the, the idea of a desert, especially against the square state uh, mentality about who's who's mostly passing uh, these opportunities. Um, but typically these are, these are, again, these are areas where there's a very, very strong sense of what the parameters need to be. And those parameters, those guardrails, typically are the consumer protection, the public interest, um, because that, that really is what the government's goal is. Um, but the the, the, the public interest or the consumer protection is not unique to the government aspects here, especially in, in an environment like now, certainly coming from, coming from the tech world. Um, uh, the incentives are aligned between between firms operating um, in any space um, and the government that's trying very hard to protect the consumers of whatever those firms' products are. Um, more than ever, uh, innovative firms are very, very uh, incentivized to make sure that they are really keeping uh, consumer interest, um, the, the public protection, um, and certainly um, uh, safety um, and those aspects really top of mind. Um, the parameters that uh, sandboxes typically require are things like insurance, um, to make sure that to the extent that there are accidents or problems, that the that the people who are who are uh, engaging in the experiments with those with those firms or companies uh, really are protected down the line, not just in the immediate instance, but in case of a problem, that they can then uh, make sure that they're that they're pursuing those uh, those protections. Um, again, the, the higher tax reg regulator relationship um, and and the transparency typically is much 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 higher in the sandbox relationships. Um, because of that, this changes a little bit about the way innovative firms have, have gone about making uh, new products or experiments. Whereas uh, uh, five or 10 years ago, a lot of the, the talk was about disruption, moving fast and breaking things. Those models really have been uh, evolving over the years and have become a much more um, engaged attempt to do the right thing, um, much more of a focus on, on virtue and really changing the world for the better, and much less of a disruption for the sake of disruption or a, even, a, even a, an appetite for having a, a much more disruptive environment. Um, part of that is because there has been so much more a regulation in most spaces, most of the innovative spaces that have been, that have been um, evolving, but part of it is just trying to make sure that to the extent sense that the, that the regulators are not able to keep in lockstep with the way the innovation is proceeding, that there is a self-regulatory environment, that there is a focus on business ethics and uh, protection from it within the firms, um, and, and indeed self-regulation. Um, and really, when it comes down to it, uh, the government can only do so much. Regulators can only do so much, even in a much more heavy touch uh, or transparent relationship. Uh, really, the only way that we can make sure as, as industry members or as uh, folks who are actually launching new products or experiments, the, way that we, the only way that we can really make sure that we are keeping the, the consumer uh, protection in, in mind is by having internal policies, having much more of a self-regulatory approach to those items. And candidly, a lot of what, uh, a lot of what I I see as being a benefit of the sandbox model is that it encourages firms to be thinking along those lines. It, it aligns incentives to the extent that they may not have been aligned or explicit ahead of experimenting in those fields. Um, but it also ensures that to the extent that those things are on top of mind, the regulator is there to remind us to make sure, you know, are we in our compliance reports? Have we made sure that we've considered these items? Um, and there's not really a lot of room for, uh, for wiggling typically um, in, um, in how these, how these uh, priorities interact. Um, and of course, there's always going to be a pendulum of regulatory attention. So right now, we're seeing a very, very uh, light shine sort of on, on innovation in general. There's not a lot of um, appetite in general for um, there being <clears throat> 
for there being uh, much operation outside of a, of a fairly explicit uh, realm. Um, but that will bounce back. There will always be sort of a back and forth. And so by encouraging self-regulation and a more self-regulatory ethics-focused uh, incentive within, within firms, uh, that really is the way to have a much longer-term focus on consumer protection um, and making sure that these are more durable rather than simply imposed from the outside but not, uh, not in keeping and not evolving at the same pace of innovation. Um, and finally, um, in, this, uh, in this environment, it's no surprise that uh, I think we need to have a public choice uh, mention. I think that that's uh, an encouragement to, uh, to, to respond in some way. Um, but uh, when thinking through um, the benefits and costs of sandboxes or of a more structured regulatory environment from the get-go, um, I encourage you to think through the way that, uh, the way that public choice operates in these sorts of fields. Um, typically, if there is a structured regulatory approach, um, everyone comes to the table at one time. There's there's a lot of interaction, there's a lot of negotiation, there's a notice and comment period. Um, there's always a, a much more uh, structured approach where everybody is uh, aligned and engaged at the same time. Whereas in a sandbox environment, there will often be a staggered approach. We talked about whether there might be an economic privilege if some firms are have the benefit or the, the are privy to these sandboxes and some aren't, or if some industry members are. Um, and that can sometimes affect the way or the timing in which folks come together to try to help um, make sure that the regulatory approach is evolving. Um, so I encourage you to think of those as being uh, not necessarily a cost, the public choice issues, but rather uh, rather something that should be considered in considering how to lay out these sandboxes, just that by making them explicit and rather than having an enforcement suspension, but rather having there be a much more explicit uh, limited duration period during which experimentation is explicitly encouraged, um, that can help to disperse the public choice issues and make sure that, that everybody is sort of aligned and focused at the same time and on the same time frame. Um, so in, in conclusion, again, it's no surprise. Um, I think that the model, the sandbox model, does generally promote innovation and makes a lot of innovation possible. Um, but it does require a firm to be cognizant and deliberate about how they will self-regulate against the backdrop of this lighter touch regulatory approach. Thank you so much, Scott. So I'm giving the panelists a few minutes to ask question or respond to the other panelist. Uh, remarks, then I'm happy to open immediately the discussion to the floor. So if you have questions, just already raise your hand because we have a couple of mics around. Otherwise, I'm going to ask a few questions. Perfect. So do we have any comments on your fellow panelist remarks? I, I have a couple. Um, so first off, thank you so much for, for the thoughtful comments. Um, so Remington, I, I, I will say I, I disagree. On, you know, per, that's why they put us both on this panel. Uh, <laughs> So uh, the, the, the truly innovative requirement, I think, is actually problematic in the sense that, one, I, I don't know if regulators are actually well equipped to determine what is and is not a truly innovative product. Now, on the other hand, I understand that you don't want a scenario in a world of limited regulatory resources where people who have the same old product that's been around for a dozen years, all of the regulatory and legal questions have been answered and are available. The, the answers are available. You don't need those firms going through a sandbox, necessarily. And maybe that's an argument against or, or a problem with the learner's permit license model is it, those firms still need to go through the pain of getting a license. And so if I'm innovative, so I get the learner's permit versus I, need, I still need the license, I'm still new, but I don't get the learner's permit, that maybe that's a problem. Maybe that just says that our licensing regimes are too onerous. Um, but I worry that allowing the regulator to say this is innovative, this is not innovative, puts the regulator in a position that they're not really well equipped to handle, and, they, and the risk is that they import their own values into it. The other, uh, the other thing you mentioned is the, the sort of the concern about blanket waivers. And I guess one question I have is if, if part of the requirement of participating in the sandbox is that the firm has a credible plan to make consumers whole if they do in fact violate the law and that violation of the law harms the consumer. And if as a, and they have the means to execute on that plan as a requirement of participating. Does that, does that assuage your concern? Because then, you know, the, the consumer is no worse off than they, than they would have been. And it seems to me that, that that is the way to go because while I agree that the consumer should not have, you know, by violation of the law be harmed, if you look at the other sort of reasons why we punish people or why we go after people, right, you have compensation for the victim. Well, that's, okay, we've taken care of that. You have punishing inherently bad acts and you have discouraging others from committing similar acts. 
if a firm's in this operating in good faith in the sandbox, they're not really a bad actor. And I don't think we want to discourage other firms from engaging, right? So I think I think we agree that like there needs to be a credible compensation scheme. But but if if you ha if that is what you have, then I think that that I think that goes to answer the the sort of the consumer protection question. And then um, I, I, so, so, Kat, uh, to your point about sort of. Um, and I think these are all good points. These are great points. Um, in terms of the public choice elements, and I didn't have time to get into this, but I do think that they're, they're, those are real concerns. And if you look at some of the sort of what I call sort of second generation sandboxes in the United States, so Utah and, and the CFPB being two examples, if you look, Utah explicitly says, you know, if you're a firm applying and you can point to another firm, a, a comparably situated competitor who's gone through the sandbox, that is a point in your favor in terms of trying to gain admission. It's not a, a guaranteed admission, but it's a point in your favor. And the, the final CFPB rule allows firms, individual firms, to point to other firms' uh, you know, agreements and say, we're very similar to them. We want to, pay, we want to basically have the same deal they have. And I think that is an important step to mitigate the sort of potential first mover advantage. And another thing Utah requires is if they if if the if the regulator rejects a a firm they have to describe in writing why they rejected the firm it's not appealable which you know i guess would be would be better but at least the firm is having to articulate here's why you don't qualify rather than just it being a no and and, and the firm not understanding why and, I, and my hope is that those will help mitigate some of these potential potential public choice concerns and will force the regulator to be very intentional about their decisions and and be able to back up any decision they make but otherwise, I think that these comments are, are, well, I mean, I think these are all great comments, including the ones I, I, I maybe disagree with or want to expand on. But I, again, I thank you very much for both reading the paper and your thoughtful comments on it. It was a pleasure. Mm -hmm. yeah. sure. um, so uh, the, so uh, very good points. Uh, I mean, the first thing on innovation, without being, you know, too kind of glib, is if not innovation, then what? You know, if, if you have to choose something to some sort of hallmark, some benchmark, rather. Um, to say you should get in uh, the sandbox um, and, 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 and innovation or something that's just new uh, sounds, I mean, it, it, it feels like that, that is the best way to go about it because if not, then what else are you choosing? Not everyone should have some sort of liability from, you know, these are generally applicable laws and regulations and everyone should abide by them. We're saying you should not, okay, fine, then why? And, and you know, and, I, and that's the re and the reason why I think it should be truly innovative. And obviously, yes, uh, we we're gonna you know I think reasonable minds can definitely differ. Um, and you know, to be blunt, do we want government officials trying to decide what you know what's innovative and what is not? Especially if a lot of them you know a lot of them aren't tech savvy, which I'm not I'm not saying they aren't. Uh, but but that would be one argument that people would make. Um, but I don't see you know. I don't see another way to to create that demarcation because again, you know, the and, and this may be the difference of what how we think about the hallmarks of a sandbox, um, but it should be in order to allow people a breathing space, you know, to, to as they're as they're trying to test to see if something works, um, to see if it's viable, um, to give them some breathing room so that they're not, they're not just super concerned all the time about uh, the, the government coming down on them, especially as it relates to your innovator, your tech person, and you have no idea that, you know, suddenly there, there is, you know, there, there are in it, in unintended consequences as it relates to discrimination. Mm -hmm. You know, that may just not come into your mind. So we're trying to, you know, give you some breathing room. And, and I don't see, and I'm happy to think through what that could look like, but I don't see anything else that we could use as that sort of, this is what, you know, let's not use innovation, let's use something else. Mm -hmm. um, and then to the second point of unlimited duration, again, I think goes the hallmark of what a sandbox is. It is to say, here's some time to test out your product, to see if it works, to see if there's a if there's a uh, a market for it. Um, and while you do that, and while you kind of test all those things out, we're gonna back off a little bit. Um, I think that the UK has been pretty successful um, in 
in, in, in its sandbox for the most part. Um, and they have used a, a fairly limited uh, duration. Uh, so I don't see why we need to, to, to kind of push our, put our hands back and say, take as long as you, as, as long as you need, um, because then that starts getting into choosing companies. Uh, you don't have to obey the law, but you have to obey the law. Um, and I don't think we, we want to get into that. I don't think we want to start choosing who gets to obey the law and who doesn't get to obey the law. And when you have these sorts of, for example, in the, uh, the a- approval uh, process, when you have, you get two years and then a very easy kind of extension, you get four years basically to not obey the law, that's, that starts to get problematic. I, I don't disagree with that. And I think that's something that's, um, when when one, so, so a lot of any regulatory experiment is going to be a line drawing exercise, and this is no exception. Um, you know, which companies are analogous enough to be considered uh, to be members of the same industry who should be in the same sandbox, which ones are slightly more um, attenuated and not, not analogous enough to be included there. Um, I think it'll always be a line drawing, and it should be. There should be an argument process by which, you know, folks try to negotiate their way their way in or by which the, the government decides at which point uh, the regulation just needs to be in place, and this doesn't and extend as far as as far as the next one down the line. Um, so I think that anytime you're talking about a regulatory change um, or environment, there will have to be some line drawing, and that's just that's just natural and not a bad thing. Um, but I think also that um, I, I think that's right that the that the that the industry members who are who have the benefit the explicit benefit of the sandbox do have a suspended period in which they have a much more. Uh, um, uh, free way of being able to see to see what works, what doesn't work. But the people, the industry members who aren't within that sandbox are also learning from that experiment. Again, one of the hallmarks of these, um, of sandboxes in general, and of any um, any uh, lower regulation experimental phase that the government's uh, regulators permit, um, ten, tends to be, one of the hallmarks is really uh, transparency. So even even those who aren't involved, either analogous in the same industry or, or more attenuated, will still have the benefit of seeing how the regulator reacts to certain things, what things wind up changing, how, how the sandbox or the environment or the regs around uh, that, that industry or that, that relationship evolve. Um, so there are still some benefits. It's not, it's not that those who aren't in are at an explicit disadvantage. Um, and in fact, again, the fact that there's just such a much higher touch oftentimes, even if not an enforcement high touch, but, a, but, a, but a, uh, you know, an observation or, or, a, or a back and forth high touch, um, it's really not a costless environment, and so I want to make sure that we're not th- that we're not conflating um, sort of a pre-regulatory or or a non-enforcement, a permanent non-enforcement environment, with the idea of there being just a, a lowered baseline or a permissive environment for a limited duration. Um, and I think and I think that that's a great point, Brian, in terms of uh, what you raised about um, having to having to uh, be very very clear about where the lines are drawn and why, that's an incredibly important thing, in part because if there are industries or or industry members who'd like to participate, a lot of times there might be a business vertical that's almost uh, within the same realm as wherever the sandbox is, um, but not quite, and there could be incentives to tweak that or to to change certain uh, certain verticals to see if if it's worthwhile participating or to start up a vertical to to try to participate in the event that there's this permissive space to do so. So I think that's that's a really important um, aspect that the the goal here is to take the environment again where um, we think of the baseline oftentimes as being a a regulatory um, assumption and the sandbox as being um, an abs a temporary absence from that I think that the goal here is to think of this as being much more of a blue sky and open space and to figure out which regulations make sense with regards to the areas in which the sandbox are operating Um, and I think that by making that explicit it really does make it so that it's more it's it industry members and firms are much more capable of deciding how to interact and how not to engage if, if not relevant to their spaces. Uh, oh, okay. yeah. I think there are a lot of hands up, so I'm just opening up to the floor uh, here in the front row. Thank you. Really interesting discussion. I have two, uh, two questions. One, I think, is mainly to Remington, but is sort of a bigger piece of the puzzle that hasn't come out so much, which is you made the great comment, if not innovation, then what? I would like to hear a little more from you and the panel about defining actually the benefit, the consumer outcomes, and the extent to which that is maybe a really underdeveloped piece of this. And if we're not weighing that with the potential consumer harm, are we missing part of the picture? And just how you see this kind of playing itself out. Um, 
And Catherine, or Cat, that's it. Uh, I was uh, interested, a little skeptical, about your comments on self-regulation and, and how now the incentives are aligned. And that's not quite the way I would read even the recent history. But I wonder if you could kind of sharpen for us your view on how self-regulation fits with a sandbox in the toolkit and also just to make the comment then that may be relevant to the question to you, Remington, about UK has been operating for many years under a fair treatment regime. And I think that in some ways prepared the base for the kind of dialogue that then makes a sandbox function in a different way than it might in different policy regimes. Thank you. Uh, so I, I think everyone here may have a different definition of innovation um, or come darn close. I would say that for me it is you are advancing a product or service that really isn't in the market yet. That it is that there is something just different about it. Um, and you don't know if it'll succeed. You don't know if it'll fail. Um, but you're just trying to push it and to see what happens. Um, and and it's just it's just different. Um, and th I mean, the, the the closest kind of example I can think of is kind of uh, uh, with you know law review articles. Like for the most part, no one wants to write something that's already been written. You want to write something that's different, and you say this is why it's different. Um, and here, that's kind of how I think about it. Is is there's just something different about it that will make life easier? That will that will change the dynamics of the state of play. And if that's so, then put forward your, your belief on why you should have a, for limited duration, an ability to kind of just go and test it um, without the specter of, of kind of regulators saying you must do X or Y. So if I could, I, I think part of the challenge with an innovation requirement, and don't get me wrong, I take your point that you gotta pick something there's no obvious answer. And I think it might vary depending on what sort of relief is being granted as well. Like the, the sensible variable depends on what relief is being granted. But like if you take a scenario of a, 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 sta a startup lender that says we use machine learning and proprietary algorithms to make lending decisions and we believe we will be better, fairer, cheaper. Well, you know, depending on the level of, of, of abstraction or analysis you use, right? It's like I'm a lender. Lenders, lending has been going on for a thousand years. You're not innovative. I'm a lender who uses machine learning and algorithms. Well, there are dozens, if not hundreds, of those. I have these proprietary algorithms, and I think the proprietary algorithm is the thing. My unique code, I think, is going to be beneficial, but I'm also worried that you know, there might be a disparate impact issue or something like that. So if I'm the regulator and I, I have to make a decision based on innovation, right? Wh at what level do I say, OK, well, your code is unique. You're, you're, so is that innovative? Or is it the fact that you're using machine learning and AI, in which case, eh. And then, you know, the other concern is what if I'm the second or third firm knocking on the door, right? You know, the first firm comes in and says, I'm using blockchain. And you're like, okay, great. We haven't seen a blockchain firm in 12 minutes. You're in. The second firm comes right behind and says, no, well, we're also using blockchain. And yeah, like this firm exists in the market, but we're, we were stood up, you know, two days apart and we have a bunch of questions too. Does the does the uh, you know does the firm, does the regular have to say I'm sorry the, you, your product already exists in the market you are held out and to one of one of Kat's points that I think is relevant here is if the reg, th this is less of a con of a concern if the sandbox is highly transparent because then the regulator can at least say yeah you know what someone who came in who looks basically like you they came in they beat you to it but you know keep keep looking at our website because we're going to be putting out reports. On, their, on, on the regulatory issues that arise, and you can use those. Those will be informative to you versus, nope, it's all opaque, and this firm is getting the benefit of counseling and, and no other firm is, in which case that, that seems to be a, a bigger problem from a, a, a privileged environment you know, standpoint. Because you would then also take that into consideration when, you're look, when, when you have the, the slate of you know, your supervisor, you know, supervising enforcement, you, you know, in theory, and this is the way I think how it should work, you're not going to go, you know, if, if the one is in the sandbox and you say, ah, you know, not going to let them do their thing um, and, and see where it plays out, you know, you're not going to immediately then just enforce the law and, 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 and just, you know, 
completely screw over the other guy because you, you, you know that they are there's similarities there. And you would you would hope that you have some sort of parity um, within enforcement. You, you would hope. It depends on – one question is it depends on how, how much are your sandbox people at the regulator talking to your enforcement people at the regulator. Sure. And – and one concern that you have to worry about is that a culture develops in the in the regulator of like the good firms come to the sandbox because they have nothing to hide, the bad firms avoid the sandbox because they are malicious. You don't, you know, I mean, obviously, I'm being a bit simplified there, but like, you know, you don't want that sort of culture developing of, you know, sandbox. Like going to, a, I would argue that generally speaking, going to applying for the sandbox is evidence of good faith. But not applying to the sandbox is not evident is not evidence of bad faith, right? Because there are other costs of, and analysis involved. Yeah. So you don't want that becoming the presumption. And just to add one more point to that, it's not even just a matter of who is applying or joining the sandbox, but also the relationship that evolves over time with the regulator when participating in the sandbox. That's something that I, I think can't be un, can't be overstated in the regulatory environment in terms of what the relationship looks like. Is there trust built? Does this firm appear to be operating not just by applying to a sandbox, but as their ongoing operations in a palms up manner? Um, that's something that I think really changes the way regulators sometimes will approach. There might be a benefit of asking a question before an enforcement action um, or of uh, discussing or trying to, to go through a process rather than simply bringing down a hammer so that can really make a difference. Um, and just to address if 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 we're if we're okay at this point, um, the self-regulation, um, I hope that I'm not I hope that I'm not coming across as saying that one is a substitute for the other. I think it is a, it is a hand in glove relationship where um, if there's a, a regulatory um, regime or, or a, an environment, um, it's really meaningless if the firms that are that are operating within that space aren't also um, you know, taking care of policies internally and trying to promote a culture of compliance and of uh, doing the right thing and thinking through what the right thing is to do. It's not always clear how those align, and that's something that I think is really tricky and that we're seeing play out a lot, especially in the more innovative companies, where um, is the benefit to be able to serve you the most targeted ads to whatever you appear to be interested in? You know, 10 years ago, that was something that I think a lot of people were much more excited about, and now there are some questions about what that means. So I think a lot of this is, I, 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 I just want to push back just gently on the idea that um, that any any firms are deliberately operating against the public interest. That I think is something that is is sometimes a trendy topic, and and sometimes there are certainly certainly um, um, examples where where it's uh, you know it's difficult to to sort of see what the incentives are. But the self regulatory culture, environments, policies, the internal items, um, I think are really an important aspect of how any functional regulatory relationship has to has to operate. Um, because without, you know, the the regulator isn't in the office with you. They're not giving counsel. They're not they're not constantly involved. And so there really does need to be um, sort of uh, an environment internally that is much more self regulatory in nature in order to make that a functional a functional operation. Yes, uh, Chris, yeah, Chris in, in the back, and then Bob. So I'm going to take two question at a time. So since we have. 10, 12 minutes if we Great. use the Italian timing. Yeah. yeah, I'll be I'll be brief. So Brian, you made an intriguing comment about um, certain types of, I think, I'm, I can't remember your exact words, but certain types of data sharing provisions for mm -hmm. entry into the regulatory sandbox. So it got me to think about, and I'd be curious anyone on the panel's thoughts about sort of an agency's um, interest in creation of regulatory sandbox as opposed to why industry might be interested and how consumers might be affected. And it might vary depending on whether the federal regulator is sort of data rich or not. And so I could see how a particular type of regulating entity might be interested in creating such a sandbox such that they could be the recipient of data to be able to figure out the, you know, if we're thinking of these as laboratories of democracy, the normatively superior way to regulate in the field. I can. Oh. Oh, question and then. Oh, yeah, sure. then yeah. Yeah. Oh. Thank you. And uh, Brian and Trace done a great job in this area and appreciate you pushing this forward. As a former regulator, I, I am uh, very split on this. Uh, on one side, it is very helpful for regulators to see what's actually happening in an innovative part of the marketplace, okay? And this is this meets that very well. And if you get to see how the process goes forward as compared to just seeing a little slice of it, you're gonna be a better regulator and you're gonna have a, a, an overall societal advancement. On the other hand, as a regulator, 
you cannot become captured or or somehow or other drawn in to, gee, I like these guys. I sit with them every week and we talk about how our business plan is going forward and still uh, still be in an objective position because you have to be able, and I, I think the real tension here is, and some of your comments have addressed this, do you get a pass on violating regulations or not? And if you really get a pass, then that's unfair to the other participants who haven't come into the system and who are not required to do so. So I think the jury is out, and I think very much the devil is in the details, and certainly appreciate any thoughts you have on that. Thank you. Uh, okay. So uh, I guess on, on, on the first question, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I, you know, some regulators are explicit in that, like, we're standing this up in part to know what's going on, because we have no idea. And this is, a, this is going to do that. Now, of course, the... The question is, is this a represent, are, are sandbox firms a representative slice of the market, or are you, in fact, getting distorted data because these are the, you know, high-tech overachiever types who also like to sign up for regulatory programs? Um, and, and is that, in fact, are, are you, in fact, getting a false perception of the market? But from at least a just pure innovation perspective, pre presumably this will help you get some insight into at least some of the cutting edge of, of the technology. And then the Bob's point, I mean, I think you're absolutely right that the devil is 100% in the details, right? I, I, I mean, to, my position is a well-designed regulatory sandbox can be a useful tool, nothing more than a tool, and it only serves a subset of, of the problem set. But poorly designed, you do run a risk of either consumers being underprotected, which is a problem. I mean, that is, that is a very real problem and does go against the, you know, the mandate of the regulator, or Consumers being adequately protected, and that's great, but certain firms getting some sort of home cooking that either intentionally or unintentionally, because you're, you know, you're right, right? You know, people build rapport, people build relationships. You kind of, you view people differently after you've hung out with them for a while. And you can like, oh, I understand why, I understand why, why Bill made that mistake. That wasn't intentional. That's just Bill's bad at math, right? Whereas, you know, oh, I, I don't know these people from a hole in the ground, so I'm going to treat them like they, they're suspect. Um, that, that type of, that risk is a concern. And so, you know, sandbox design is critical. And I do think that sandbox programs, like the states that stand them up or, or railways stand them, should be constantly evaluating them and constantly sort of modifying them and saying, okay, and reporting out information, not just about, you know, here's the regulatory learnings we developed, but also, okay, look, here, here's how the sandboxes went, right? You know, four of these firms failed, but they failed softly. Three of them are going great. One of them we actually had to drop the hammer on because they, it turns out they're scumbags, right? That type of information is, is, is useful for the public to assess whether or not these programs actually are worth it and also to help the regulator assess, well, are we not catching things soon, soon enough? What do we need to do to change it? Or are we being over, you know, hypervigilant to the point where it's 100% false positives and maybe we can back off a little bit? I don't quite no, go ahead, uh, so just quickly, I, you know, I, I think that's one of the reasons why, uh, you know, I'm very much against uh, allowing trade associations and other groups um, to apply on behalf of of a swath of entities. Because, you know, then I would say, you know, I'm tired of being a nonprofit lawyer. I'm going to go, you know, I'm going to go to a firm. I'm going to specialize in this. And then I'm going to get lots of clients. And, and I, you know, I will become a specialist in writing these applications. And suddenly I'm profiting off of this. Suddenly people are going to start saying, if I want to have some favored, you know, position, then you better go to, to this trade association or that one because they just have, they know how to do this. They have a good understanding of it. And then suddenly you have this, this capture, which I think is probably I think that's right, and, and the, the the one uh, piece that I'd like to add is um, I these they almost benefit uh, agencies side maybe not as much but but a lot in my experience regulators tend to be curious and interested and the more sophisticated uh, agencies and regulators are to what the business is doing the better the better they can help to craft rules to respond um, sometimes to the detriment of the industry who'd prefer not to have you know such sophisticated rules addressing the intricacies of the business uh, for better. For 
for worse. Um, but I think that there are a lot of, um, it, it's not, I, I think it's a mistake to think of these as being a one-sided benefit where firms get a pass for a while um, and uh, and then and then get to go forward with this with this client base or consumer base that they've been able to to sort of uh, to work through in that interim time. I think that the benefit is on both sides, um, and the typical response after these after these sandbox experiments tends to be regs or tends to be a relationship in which there's a really clear enforcement um, uh, a scenario or, or or a regulatory environment laid out. Um, and I think that's the benefit of both sides. Um, so I, I do think that there's um, I, I just don't see it as being sort of a one-sided advantage. We have, I think, three more minutes, and I don't want to be too Italian, so we should try to finish on time. <laughs> Here in the front, it's okay. I don't want the stigma to follow me. Mm. Well, uh, so I, I want to thank all four of you for taking the time to be on this panel today. Um, my name is Trace. I am Brian's co-author on this paper. Uh, I want to go back to this question of innovation. I think it's a little bit complicated because a lot of sandboxes actually have a technologically innovative requirement. And that complicates the situation a little further. It's not just that a product or service is innovative, but that it's technologically innovative. I wonder, and I want to pose this as a question, if the solution is whether it raises a novel legal issue. A, that gets to kind of the very heart of what a sandbox is supposed to do. It's supposed to clarify legal uncertainty for new and innovative products. And B, it gets around this issue of regulatory dis discretion, not perfectly, but it definitely mitigates against it. Because if a regulator comes to you and says, no, you don't pose a novel legal issue in question, well, you have your answer. You go through the traditional mechanism. You, you have your legal certainty that you've been trying to pursue. However, if it does, it allows firms that may not have some brand new innovative technology, but do pose novel legal issues and questions where they wouldn't wouldn't have certainty that they'd be able to come to market or go through the traditional licensing process. And B, prevents maybe a highly new technologically innovative company that doesn't pose any new legal issues, but just uses this new technology in an efficient new way. So I wonder if it's the, the novelty of the legal question that may be the, the good mechanism for triggering sandbox admittance. Sure. I, I, yeah. so, I'm so, sorry about that. I, I think that's a great Point, Trace. I, I think the one challenge would be sometimes you don't know you have a novel legal issue until you've kind of gotten in there a little bit. And the other thing would be, it, it kind of the, like you know, it depends on what the what the jurisdiction is trying to accomplish. Because if what they're trying to accomplish is driving in competition, then the learner permit license structure actually kind of makes some sense regardless of whether or not there's a novel legal issue. But I will say, if you're granting a lot of learner, learner's permits, that may well be indicia that your licensing program is just too onerous, and then you should go change that. Great. Last question. Fantastic. Yeah, thank you all for the very interesting panel. I had a question going to the innovation side again as to when there are actually gaps in uh, regulation. So I'm thinking of it in the context of financial uh, innovations where you could design products, especially in blockchain and in those areas, to either fall under the category of a derivative or commodity, equity or funding. Uh, and these products might not be specifically clear as to where the regulation stands, and you have to have a network effect to make it work. It seems to me that that would be a perfect sort of sandbox opportunity. If it turned out that that product ended up being a favorite product to money launderers, I imagine the sandbox is not going to protect the people who design it for two years anyway. So I don't see that that being, as being much of a danger, but I think there are areas where we don't have rules or clear rules on this, and we won't have rules until there's legislation. That's going to take a long time. And so in that context, it seems that if there are those gaps that have been identified, if the SEC and CFTC can't agree on who's going to regulate something, that might also be something that should be taken into consideration. Yeah. Uh, a minute. Yeah. That's yeah. Great. For that, each of you, you can say like a quick answer. Otherwise, I'm in trouble, and I'm just there. <laughs> Okay. Oh, okay. Good. Okay. So then, uh, great point. I, I think the one risk you're going to have, which is a topic we didn't get a chance to talk about, which is that in a fractured regulatory environment, you're as regulated as your most aggressive regulator says you are. So even if the SEC says, "Yeah, we have a sandbox. Let's figure it out," if the CFTC says, "Buddy, if you end up on my side of the line, I'm going to come down on you like a ton of bricks if you if you do it," the sandbox does you no good. Mm -hmm. Well, I would just go back to, you know, this idea of, of, of regulatory humility, which Mick Mulvaney talks about. Um, we should, I think, start on kind of uh, 
the, the baseline, what is the most narrowest way to think about this given that the stakes are so high, and, and then move from there and have agencies work together and do something that is, is um, humble um, because, because doing more than that um, could really um, hurt the, the, the broader environment. I think that's right. I also just add, I think it goes to how you craft that sandbox because the goal is to figure out where there need to be parameters going forward and what things are possible, what things are not foreseeable now but might become foreseeable quickly. So I think that the goal there would be to say, how can we identify the risks that aren't obvious from the outset and how can we make sure that if there is a sandbox in place that we can quickly evolve and respond and shut it down if there's a real problem and that it's not, per it's not permitting this to go forward but rather educating the folks that are involved so they can respond in, in real time. Fantastic. So please join me in thanking this amazing panel.